done before the exam. So uh, please, please participate and interact with me. Otherwise, it's going to be a long two hours. So let's get started. Dim the lights. Note. Is that better? Okay. No sleeping. Okay. So we're going to start with cardiology, uh, just because it's everywhere um, on the exam. So it's a good topic to be comfortable with. Uh, here's your patient. He comes in with chest pain. What do you want to do? Best first test. That's how a lot of these questions are written. Best first test, best initial treatment, best next step. Let's do an EKG first. So do an EKG. That is your best first test for a patient with chest pain. Um, and what are you looking for on that EKG? ST changes. So we're going to look for ST elevation. Uh, is that the only criteria to diagnose a STEMI? What else is a scary EKG change if it's new? A new left bundle branch block is also scary. So uh, our criteria for a positive EKG are two millimeters of ST elevation. Hey, what's up? Um, or uh, a new left bundle branch block. Uh, and if you don't remember what that looks like from your EKG course, that's kind of a wide, flattened QRS. Uh, either of those fulfill criteria for a STEMI. So um, the ST elevation occurs pretty much immediately. And remember, there are some later changes in the EKG after an MI. Uh, T wave inversion um, happens a little bit later, and then the Q waves, those are our markers of an old infarct. They last pretty much forever. So um, also remember, this is prone to come up uh, probably in one or two questions on your shelf, where in the EKG you're looking for these different types of infarcts. So particularly, remember 2, 3, and AVF. If you see 2, 3, and AVF either described in a question stem or on an EKG printout, uh, that tells you that the right coronary artery was infarcted, and it correlates with an inferior infarct. The rest of those, um, probably a little less likely to show up. Uh, you know, memorize them if you have the brain space. But definitely 2, 3, and AVF, remember that that's inferior, and that's the right coronary artery. So um, treatment of a STEMI, we're going to want to restore blood flow, right? That's the problem. So we want to restore blood flow. And the cath lab uh, is, is the best. Thrombolytics, when can we give thrombolytics? What's the window where thrombolytics are um, allowable? The book I read said six. So thrombolytics, if you catch them within six hours, um, or if you can't get them to a facility where they have a cath lab uh, within, within a reasonable amount of time, then you can give thrombolytics. The, oh, hey, friends. So the contraindications for thrombolytic therapy uh, might also show up on your exam. So some contraindications to thrombolytics, anybody? Yeah, so if you're bleeding, right, thrombolytics is not a good choice. When else? Sure. So if they're anticoagulated, you'd be a little bit more cautious. Um, ever, ever a hemorrhagic stroke. So ever in the past, if they had a hemorrhagic stroke, you can't give thrombolytics. If they had a recent ischemic stroke, you can't give thrombolytics. Um, and then recent closed head trauma. So if they you know, uh, fell off a horse and then had a heart attack, no thrombolytics for them. Not allowed. So... Um, also, something that comes up in the QBanks, I don't remember it on my test, but I got like a million questions on it in the QBanks that I did, uh, this case of a right ventricular infarction. So the symptom complex is different than a regular garden variety MI, which is, I think, why they like to ask about it. Uh, and it's a patient who has hypotension and tachycardia, so they're kind of shocky. They do have JVD, but their lungs are clear, so they don't have the, the crackly um, you know, cardiac pulmonary edema, and they also don't have pulses paradoxes. So it's a kind of a confusing clinical picture unless you're looking for it. Uh, so kind of in a nutshell, if you see somebody that looks like they're in shock, they've got JVD, but their lungs are clear, think about a right ventricular infarction. And this is important because the treatment is, is uh, drastically different between this type of MI and, and the garden variety type. You don't give nitro, and why is that? If your right, ventri your right ventricle has failed, why is nitro a bad idea? Ooh, I hear, I hear whispers. So basically it's because these patients are, are having a problem with preload, right? Their right ventricle can't pump 
They can't get the blood to the lungs and then to the right side of the heart. So really the best treatment here is fluids. They need preload um, to be added. And nitro is a vasodilator or venodilator, so it's going to further decrease the preload and actually worsen their shock-like picture. So don't know if it'll be on your shelf, um, but it was in enough of the question banks and review books, I figured it was worth a mention. So let's say we did our EKG and there was no ST elevation. What's the next test we want to do for our patient with chest pain? Chest X-ray will probably be done if you're in the ER, right? They, they like to do those. But if we're, our patient still has chest pain, the EKG was normal. Are we totally reassured? What, sh what should we do to make sure there's not something cardiac going on? Yeah, now let's do our biomarkers. So cardiac enzymes is the next test. So if you're given a clinical scenario, the EKG has already been done, it's normal. Now we want to order our cardiac enzymes. Uh, and if the first set is normal, are we done? Go home? Hit the happy hour? No. Yeah, so we need at least three sets, right? Um, Q8 is typically how it's done at most hospitals. And why is that? Why do we check more than one set? This is back to step one. Yeah, so most of them won't all, they won't all be increased if you catch it early enough. So they have different rates of rise depending on the different cardiac enzymes. So we check every, you know, six to eight hours to detect a trend. Um, and what I'll point out here is myoglobin, it's the one that rises first. It also drops off first. So if you get a question with a patient who had an MI and they're in the hospital, you're watching them, what's the most sensitive marker for a repeat infarction, a second heart attack? You'll want to look at the myoglobin because CKMB and troponin can both still be elevated from the first um, heart attack. So a second infarction can be picked up by myoglobin because it's the first to go up and it's the first to go down. You wouldn't expect it to still be elevated a couple days later. Okay, so we treat these n semis uh, with morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, or clopidogrel, and a beta blocker. That's kind of your um, classic cocktail for a cardiac patient. And coronary angiography is the best test to schedule for these patients. You'll want to get this test ordered within 48 hours because that's really how we determine how to proceed from there. So coronary angiography tells us whether or not we need to do some kind of intervention. And what are our options for intervention? Stent or, or cabbage, right? So stent or bypass. And stent is really the standard of treatment unless your patient has certain factors that make cabbage the preferred option. And you need to know those. When do you do cabbage instead of a PCI? So if you've got left main disease or three-vessel disease, unless you're a diabetic and then the threshold is lower, two-vessel disease and a diabetic, or three-vessel disease or left main. Um, yes. So, Or if there's greater than 70% occlusion, um, or if they're just really sick. So you've given them maximum medical treatment, but they're still really symptomatic, still having pain, um, or after an infarction a few days later, they've got terrible angina where you're suspicious of a reinfarction. Those are all reasons for cabbage instead of uh, stenting. So we always send these folks home on aspirin um, or clopidogrel if they've got a stent. They always need a beta blocker. They need an ACE inhibitor, particularly if they've got some type of left ventricular dysfunction, and we need to give them a statin uh, for, for prevention of future disease. And then nitrates for their chest pain. Okay, so what if our cardiac enzymes were negative? What are we calling our patient with chest pain? A faker. So pessimistic for so early in your medical career. So let's assume they're not faking, because they rarely are on the shelf exams. You rarely have a faker of a patient on your shelf exams. Real life, maybe. Shelf exam, no. So they've got chest pain. It's, you know, it's terrible. It's crushing. Substernal radiates to their left arm. It's unstable angina. Any new angina is unstable, right? Even if it's just uh, with exertion, um, if it's new, it's unstable. So the workup for unstable angina, you'll want to schedule an exercise EKG for these folks. Uh, and they may ask you what types of medicines you should discontinue before an exercise stress test. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers would be the answer there. Uh, there are some reasons you can't do an EKG stress test, and they like to ask about these. If they've got an old left bundle on their EKG, it makes it very difficult to interpret. If they've got that wide, weird uh, QRS complex, it can make it difficult to assess for any ST changes during exercise. So, um, 
So that would be an indication to do an echo instead of an EKG. Also, if they're on uh, digoxin, that makes interpreting the results of a stress test uh, unreliable, so an echo would be indicated there also. Uh, there are a lot of patients, you probably noticed, that can't perform exercise necessary for an exercise stress test, and in those patients, we chemically stress them. So dibutamine or adenosine uh, are the chemicals we use there, and then MUGA, you may have seen this ordered or heard about it, so a nuclear medicine test that can show the actual perfusion to the heart so you can see very clearly if there's any area of blockage that's leading to ischemia. So what does a positive test look like? It's if they have their chest pain, if they have their characteristic symptoms upon exercise, that's a positive test. If there's ST depression, uh, it's a positive test. Or if their blood pressure drops, the test is also positive. So anytime you have a positive stress test, got to get them to the cath lab, uh, and they need to get some coronary angiography. Okay, so after uh, uh, NMI, what do we worry about in our patients? The most common cause of death in a patient who had a heart attack? Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia. Very good. V-fib is the scariest one, right? So uh, what if our post-MI patient has a new systolic murmur five to seven days after their MI? It's a new systolic murmur. Regurge from papillary muscle rupture, absolutely. So the papillary muscles can become ischemic, weaken in the uh, remodeling phase. Remember that from step one? Uh, they can rupture, and that causes a regurge murmur. So it's a new systolic murmur you can hear. What if there is a murmur, but they also have acute hypotension, really sick, basically on death's door? What might have ruptured there? The free wall. So that's a ventricular free wall rupture. Um, if you notice a step up in oxygen concentration between the right atrium and the right ventricle, that's septal rupture. Those are the buzzwords for a septal rupture. And it makes sense, right? If you have more oxygen in the right ventricle than in the right atrium, that means some of the oxygenated blood from the left side is scooting on over there to increase the oxygen content. Uh, if you see persistent ST elevation a month later, with a systolic mitral regurge murmur. This one's kind of random. Not Dressler, I'm getting there. You're ahead of me. This is a ventricular wall aneurysm. Um, not sure why the persistent ST elevation. It may just be because of the thinner wall of the aneurysm um, inherently doesn't have the blood supply necessary, so you see the ST changes. Uh, and the, the MR murmur is because of the flow in and around the aneurysm outpocketing. So, Canon A waves, they love to describe this on physical exam. Do you guys know what Canon A waves are, what you look for? Where do you look for Canon A waves? The, the jugular, right? You look at the JVP and you just see them bounding. They're Canon, you know, uh, bounding Canon A waves. And what do they tell you? Something's wrong with the heart. Oh, well, I'm not to dress there yet. Jump in the gun. So what would make blood bound back up to the neck? Sort of. It's a problem with the tricuspid. So what makes the cannon A wave is when the, the, um, the valve between the atria and the ventricle is not opening in conjunction with the cardiac cycle. So you know, you're supposed to open the valve and blood goes, goes through, but if there's AV dissociation, the valve isn't opening and closing properly, so blood, instead of going forward like it's supposed to, kind of rebounds back and gives the cannon A waves that's visible in the JVP. So cannon A waves, in general, means atrial ventricular dissociation, uh, and in this case, it can be due to third-degree heart lock if the, if the um, AV node is ischemic. So, but in general, cannon A waves mean the atria and the ventricles aren't communicating properly. There's AV dissociation. Now, here we go. Five to ten weeks later, pleuritic chest pain and a low-grade temperature. Here's your Dresler syndrome. Here's your Dresler syndrome. This is thought to be autoimmune, uh, cause of pericarditis, and we treat this with aspirin on NSAIDs. Okay. So now I've got a young, healthy patient, and he's got chest pain. Now, we do an EKG because that's what we always do, right? Best first test for chest pain, and we see this. I don't know if it's big enough, but can anybody tell me something characteristic about this EKG? Yes, diffuse ST elevation. Please know this EKG because you might see it. 
Um, so what does diffuse ST elevation tell you? It tells you pericarditis. So other things they might tell you in the clinical vignette, the chest pain is worse with inspiration or pleuritic. It's better when they lean forward, so position uh, affects the chest pain. And you might hear that rub uh, that you might have heard on, on step one, right, when you had to listen to the little murmurs. It was a friction rub. So this is pericarditis. And what do we do for it? NSAIDs, right? We just said that. So, um, okay, so some other causes of chest pain. If they tell you the pain is reproducible with palpation, think costochondriasis. Um, if it's kind of vague chest pain and they've, they had a, a viral infection a few weeks or a few months ago and they have a new murmur, myocarditis might be on the differential. Um, if the pain occurs at rest, is worse at night, uh, usually in a lady who also has migraines, think about Prenz metals angina. So uh, this is characteristically worse early in the morning. And the test we use to diagnose this type of angina is an ergonovine stimulation test um, to, to characterize whether blood vessel spasming might be causing this angina. And calcium channel blockers and nitrates are the treatment of choice here. All right, EKG time. So this first one, anybody want to take a crack at it? What about the P waves? Winky Bach, yes. Do you guys see that YouTube video? Yeah. It's hilarious. If you haven't seen it, you should Google it. So the way they might describe this in a, in a clinical vignette, it's progressive prolongation of the PR interval followed by a dropped beat. And that, as you guys correctly identified, is Winky Bach. Or Mobitz type one. Mobitz type one. Okay. So what about this second one? Third degree heart block. So what might you see on physical exam? Cannon A waves. Yay. Good. Yeah. So this is third degree heart block. Uh, what they might tell you in the clinical vignette, they might tell you they found Cannon A waves on physical exam. They also might describe it as a regular P to P interval and a regular R to R interval. But as we can see from the EKG, they're not associated with each other at all. There's not a P before every QRS um, spaced out regularly. So good. What about the second one or the third one? Not AFib, not AFib. With AFib, you typically can't see P waves. Good, this is MAT. So what they might tell you in the clinical vignette, if they don't give you this picture, they might describe it as varying PR intervals with three or more morphologically distinct P waves in the same lead. Um, and this is good to know because it's bad news in terms of prognosis. This really happens in sick, sick patients with bad pneumonia or otherwise really terrible respiratory disease. So. Um, if you see something and it looks kind of weird, you take a look at the P waves because if you can see them, it's probably not a fib. And if you if you find three that are different looking from each other, either inverted or a little sine wave or peaked and not peaked, if you see different P waves, think about MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. All right, top one here. When do you notice? Are the QRS is narrow or wide? They're wide, so that helps narrow down your, your possibilities. So it's wide. Is it fast or slow or regular? It's fast, so it's, uh, fa it's a tachycardia with wide QRS. So, yes, it's VTAC. So the description they might give you, if they didn't show you the picture, three or more consecutive beats with a QRS. Um, Oh, less than 120 at a rate of greater than 120. So I led you astray. That's not a wide complex. And if we had counted the beats, that isn't greater than a block and a half. Sorry about that. I led you astray there. So this is not a wide complex. Um, so it's just ventricular tachycardia. So, okay. So how do we treat VTAC? It depends on how the patient looks, right? If the patient's unstable, hypotensive, uh, unconscious, non-responsive, how do we treat them? Shock them, right? And then if they are stable, then we can use medical treatment. We can treat them with lidocaine or amiodarone. So it depends on how the patient looks. Are they stable or unstable? What is their blood pressure doing, et cetera? So the second strip there. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of small. 
You notice anything about like this region right here? Yeah, can you convince yourself that that's a delta wave? Maybe it's not the best example I could have found on the internet via Google image, but that is supposed to be a delta wave. So then what does that mean this rhythm is? Yeah, it's WPW, it's Wolf Parkinson White. So they might describe it as a short PR interval followed by QRS uh, greater than 120. So this is a wide QRS complex with a slurred initial deflection representing early ventricular activation through that bundle of Kent. So super important, how do we treat WPW? The drug of choice was important on step one, it's important for the medicine shelf. Procainamide, very good. Procainamide is the drug of choice for WPW. Even more importantly, what are you not gonna give these patients? What medications are contraindicated in WPW? Anything that slows AV conduction. So beta blockers are contraindicated. Digoxin is contraindicated. Uh, the, the calcium channel blockers that affect the AV node, uh, verapamil and diltiazam are contraindicated. Because remember, anytime we slow conduction through the AV node, that's just allowing more of the signal to go through that squirrely bundle of Kent and screwing it up even worse. So they might give you the, the picture. I think I got a, a question about like the medical student or the resident who went into the ER with palpitations uh, and they gave him a, a beta blocker and then he sued the ER doctor two years later. You know, why, what did they give him that facilitated the lawsuit or something like that? So, um, or why? What was the basis? So remember the pathophysiology here and that helps you remember what drugs you wouldn't want to give because it would worsen the arrhythmia instead of making it better. Okay, so what about the third one? That's flutter. See the sawtooth? So they might describe it as regular rhythm with a ventricular rate uh, that's between 125 and 150, and the atrial rate that's even higher, about twice that, 250 or 300. So that's two to one um, if we've got that distinction between ventricular and atrial rate. And how do we treat a flutter? Again, if the patient's unstable, it's easy, you shock them. Anytime they have an arrhythmia and they're unstable, you cardiovert. So that's easy. Uh, if they're medically stable, here's where beta blockers and digoxin have a role. So it's kind of similar treatment to rate control for atrial fibrillation. A flutter and AFib are treated very similarly. Then that last one, would you like that to be your EKG? No. So what's that? Yes, that's torsades. So they might describe it as a prolonged QT interval leading to undulating rotation of the QRS complex around the baseline. Uh, and in the clinical vignette, Look for some kind of electrolyte abnormality. Uh, low potassium and low magnesium can predispose a patient to this. And then um, extending into the psych realm, a tricyclic overdose can also cause torsades. Okay, so what's this first one? Slow, fast, or normal? That's fast, so it's a tachycardia. Take a guess. Ectopic atrial. This is supraventricular, supraventricular tachycardia. This is SVT. So they might describe it. I think it's kind of hard to pick it out based on the EKG alone. The description makes it a little easier. If they told you it was regular rhythm and the rate was somewhere between 150 and 220, uh, also, the clinical symptoms help you here. This is like the 27, 28-year-old guy or girl who just suddenly has these terrible palpitations and then they suddenly go away. So there's a sudden onset and offset that's also pretty characteristic of SVT. Uh, now, what's the first-line treatment for SVT? Very first thing you do for them when they walk in the door. Yes, carotid massage, good, because they're going to try to trip you up by giving you a bunch of drugs to choose from. But first-line treatment is actually non-pharmacologic. Non carotid sinus massage, uh, for, the, for the kids, we shove their face in ice water. I guess you could do that for adults, too. Um, so uh, non-meds non first, and then um, your, your medications. This is where adenosine comes into play. So with a tachycardia, adenosine might be the right answer if, if they're looking for a medication. So the second one here, there's kind of a lot going on. What I want you to look at is this business. What's that? That's a T wave that's peaked. That's a peak T wave. So what does that make us think of? Hyperkalemia, good. The medicine folks love hyperkalemia, don't they? 
So um, in the clinical vignette, they might tell you this is a renal patient who missed a bunch of dialysis appointments. Could be crush injury because the uh, potassium is released from the damaged cells, burn victim, blah, blah, blah. The T waves are peaked. The QRS is wide. Uh, the QT interval is short. And the PR interval is long. So hopefully they give you peaked T waves. I had a couple questions on my QBank where they gave you those other EKG findings described, uh, like the widened QRS and the short QT. So if you want to be safe, know them all. Um, and I missed this one like three or four times on my QBank, this third one right here. WTF is that. Right? What did you notice about this EKG? So the baseline is kind of undulating, and that helps with the name. It's not MIT, because um, we don't really see morphologically distinct P waves. It's kind of hard to see them because it's such low voltage. So the two hallmarks here is there's alternate beat variation in direction, so it's kind of undulating, um, and then it's very low, low volume. So the clinical picture helps, right? You also notice pulses paradoxus hypotension, and distant heart sounds, and JVD. What does that picture make you think of? That's tamponade. So this is the EKG finding of tamponade. It's called electrical alternans. Electrical alternans. So it's kind of alternating. That's where the alternans comes from. And it makes sense if we've got tamponade, right? That blood is filling up the, um, the sac, so it's, it's dampening the voltage. That's why it's so short, why it's such a, a low-voltage EKG tracing. All right, number four. There you go. Can't really see P waves there, right? Just kind of some squiggly business um, along the baseline. So this is a fib. They might describe it as an undulating baseline. Can't see the P waves. It's irregularly irregular. And the clinical vignette, um, the patient might be hyperthyroid. That's pretty common. Um, or somebody taking too much of their synthroid. Might be some old dude with uh, sudden palpitations, shortness of breath. Um, or somebody with uh, uh, CHF who has valve disease, right? Because if your, if your mitral valve is really bad, that leads to dilation of the left atria, which predisposes to, to atrial fibrillation. So rate control or rhythm control, which is better? Yeah, neither of them are better, so we do rate control, right? Rhythm control hasn't been proven to, to be any better than rate control, so we use drugs to control the rate of atrial fibrillation in our first line of treatment. So um, how do we do that? What meds? Yeah, beta blocker, DIG. Yeah, those are kind of the mainstays. Okay. So any questions about EKGs? I tried to pull out all the ones that I got questions on, either in real life or in QBank land. All right, so now let's go to murmurs, the other common question type in the cardiology section. So I've got a systolic murmur. It's crescendo, decrescendo. It's louder when they squat, softer when they valsalva, and you might see parvus et tardis in their pulses when you're palpating um, aortic pulse or a peripheral pulse. Aortic stenosis, very good. So some things that might cause aortic stenosis. So old, right, calcific uh, degeneration, I think is what it's called, of the valve. So it just could be old. Yeah, or if it's congenitally, the aortic valve is bicuspid, that might predispose someone to get it a little bit younger. More importantly, how do we treat it? Yeah, so do we shove a balloon in there and uh, open up the stenotic valve, or do we just replace the whole enchilada? We replace it. So valve replacement is the standard of treatment. You only would do a balloon valvuloplasty if uh, you were just stabilizing the patient so you could get them to somewhere that could perform the operation. So, okay. So what about this second dude? It's also a systolic murmur, but it's louder with valsalva, softer with squatting, and hand grip. This might be a young patient in for their sports physical. Hypertrophic... Uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy. So this is hokum. The hallmarks to remember here is it'll typically be a younger patient. That'll help you, but also louder with valsalva because um, the systolic ejection murmur of aortic stenosis is softer with valsalva because valsalva decreases preload, right? So that makes less blood go across the stenosed valve. So that'll 
improve an aortic stenosis murmur, but it'll worsen a HOCA murmur. So that's kind of the differentiating factor that I remembered. Uh, now, where it becomes tricky is in this third fella, late systolic murmur with a click. And it's louder with Valsalva, just like hokum, uh, but softer with squatting. The key is the click. This also might be a younger patient. Yeah, so this is mitral valve prolapse, MVP. So this patient clinically might present with palpitations, some syncope, um, and then the murmur actually can be pretty loud. In our last systolic murmur, this one radiates to the axilla, and it's different from the other ones in that it's not an ejection murmur, it's holosystolic. Yes, MR. This is mitral regurgitation. Good. Okay, so another holosystolic murmur, but this is in kiddos. Most common congenital heart defect. VSD. Yeah, you thought there wouldn't be any peds on your test, but there might be. Um, and then a continuous machine-like murmur. Remember this from step one? PDA. Wide, fixed, and split S2. That's an ASD. Those are kind of just the, the key buzzwords. And then a rumbling diastolic murmur with an opening snap. Um, if you did an echo, you might see left atrial enlargement and it predisposes to AFib. Mitral stenosis, good. Um, and blowing diastolic murmur with a widened pulse pressure. And this is the one with like the water hammer pulse, uh, all those dead guys that have their, you know, you know. I don't remember them anymore because I already took my steps, but you guys know. What's this one? Yeah, so this is aortic regurgitation. Mitral stenosis and aortic regurg are the two most important diastolic murmurs, at least in the adult population. So, okay. So really, when a patient comes in, they're not coming in, you're reading about them in the clinical vignette, they can have shortness of breath for cardiac or pulmonary reasons, right? So um, if you suspect a pulmonary embolus, that can cause shortness of breath, and that's a really scary cause of shortness of breath. You want to give heparin right away. Before you do your workup, Heparin first is always the right answer if you really suspect um, a pulmonary embolus. You'll always want to check the, the O2 stat. Uh, if the pulse ox isn't given in the clinical vignette and the option to get one is there, that's usually a good idea. Um, anytime you suspect pneumonia, like if there are those characteristic breath sounds, egophony, all that business, you want to get a chest X-ray. Um, anytime somebody with congestive heart failure has a murmur, an echo is the right study to get um, and compare it to an old echo to see if it's progressing. And for acute pulmonary edema, I got this question a lot in the Q banks. The, the trifecta of medications are nitrates, Lasix, and morphine. Um, any patient who kind of looks like they have CHF, but they're young, they're not our old, old person who we expect to have it, uh, Think about myocarditis. This is like the kind of random cardiac problem that mimics a lot of other things and has a confusing constellation of symptoms. So if they're young, if they had the flu a couple weeks ago, and they either have uh, shortness of breath upon exertion or need three pillows at night, uh, think about Coxsackie B or some other viral form of, of myocarditis. And then also in a young patient, a cause of shortness of breath might be primary, primary pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and this will cause cardiomegaly on a chest X-ray, and a right heart cath is the next study to order because it can really definitively tell you uh, whether it is primary pulmonary hypertension or congestive heart failure. And how is that? What pressure are you looking for on right heart cath? Good. See my high-tech drawing I made on paint? So uh, this is your heart over here. These are your lungs. Um, and if the problem is your heart, right, uh, the problem is your heart, the you know, congestive heart failure, your ventricle can't contract, you're not propelling blood forward, it's going to back up here, right, into the left atrium. And pulmonary capillary reg pressure we use as a surrogate for left atrial pressure. So in CHF, this is going to be high. Whereas in your primary pulmonary hypertension, the problem is here. There's increased resistance in the pulmonary vessels, so... Uh, the blood doesn't even get to the left atrium, it backs up into the pulmonary artery. So in CHF, we have high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. In primary pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal. 
So that's really the key pressure to look at. They often give you a bunch of different pressures in these chambers and, and vessels. You really don't need them if that's, the, if that's the determination you're trying to make. All right, so um, if you did medicine uh, at any of the sites that we do medicine at here, you've seen a lot of CHF uh, and have seen how to manage it. So remember that it's divided into systolic and diastolic, depending on whether the problem is propelling blood forward or um, relaxing the heart and diastole. And the things that I saw questions asked about, are there reversible causes of either? So alcoholic dilated cardiomyopathy is reversible if they stop drinking, which they never do. Uh, and then hemochromatosis causes a restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is diastolic dysfunction, and that's also reversible with phlebotomy. So if you reduce the overall iron overload in the body, uh, you can get some of your ejection fraction back, which is nice. So treatment of CHF, remember the medications that improve survival. Remember ACE inhibitors have been shown to prove, uh, improve survival and beta blockers as well for the same reason. They prevent remodeling in the ventricle. ACE inhibitors because they block aldosterone from remodeling and beta blockers because they prevent epinephrine and norepinephrine from remodeling. Um, spironolactone, this is kind of newer. It's improved survival only if the heart failure is really bad, class three or four. Uh, and then digoxin is usually the detractor answer. It does not improve survival, but it does help symptoms. So we give it to patients, it makes them feel better. They're less likely to be hospitalized with an exacerbation. All right, lungs. Got to know your chest x-rays. What do we see on this first one? Yeah, so um, this business right here, not normal. Oops, don't look at that. So uh, here's a low bar consolidation. Um, they might describe air bronchograms, which I always have a hard time seeing. This is pneumonia. The second one? Yeah, so what they might describe, the lung fields are really black, right? That's called hyperlucent, and the diaphragms are very flat. See a lot of air trapping. So that is COPD. And the third one? Yeah, so they describe it. The heart is big, greater than half of the AP diameter. Uh, there's curly D lines and kind of fluffy interstitial edema, that's CHF. The fourth one? Yuck, what's that? Cavity containing an air fluid level, does that help? That's an abscess. That's an abscess. Caused by what kind of bug? Staph can and also anaerobics like to cause abscesses. And then my last picture. Kind of hard to see. Yeah, good. It is TB. They might describe upper lobe cavitation, consolidation, and they may show hilar adenopathy. That's tuberculosis. And then the last one, I couldn't see a picture. I couldn't find a picture, but the description in the question stem says that there's a thickened peritracheal stripe and splayed carina bifurcation. So the carina is, um, you know, instead of being nice like this, it's kind of splayed upward. Not sarcoid. It's, think of some crap that would spread the carina. You know, instead of being nice, it's all splayed, splayed open. What would get in the way to esophageal rupture? No. Oops. Okay, I guess I'll have to tell you. So two things, um, right? Think of where the left atrium is in the context of the heart, right? It's in the back. So if the left atrium is enlarged, that can start to push on the carina and cause it to splay. So really bad mitral stenosis can cause this chest X-ray finding. The other thing, um, which I'm more interested in these days, is cancer. Uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy can also get in the way of the carina and splay it open. So cancer, really bulky mediastinal disease can do it. And also, which is probably more likely to be on your test, um, left atrial enlargement for mitral stenosis. All right, pleural effusions. So remember, if you see more than a centimeter on your lateral decubitus x-ray, you tap it so you can see it. Um, and please, please, please know the difference between transidative and exudative effusions. So uh, if it's transidative, remember the causes are more likely systemic. They're um, big picture diseases. CHF, uh, nephrotic syndrome, or cirrhosis can cause transidative. Some other random buzzwords, if it's transidative and also has low glucose. Did you say it? Oh, uh, complicated more um, is a term I've heard to describe exudative. I was thinking of rheumatoid arthritis. Because in RA, there's lots of uh, white blood cells, right? It's an autoimmune disease. 
there's lots of white blood cells around, lots of inflammation, those white blood cells eat up glucose just like bacteria. So if you're thinking low glucose and exudative, that's a bug. If you're thinking low glucose and transudative, that's RA. Uh, high lymphocytes in a transudative effusion, that's tuberculosis. And if it's bloody, yeah, bad, bad news. Either PE um, and sometimes cancer-related pleural effusions can be transudative. So if it's exudative, the most common cause is cancer can also cause this type of effusion, um, and pneumonia is, is more common. A paranemonic effusion is more likely to be exudative. And then complicated it means either you see bugs, it's gram stain positive, um, it's, it's really acidic, the pH is less than 7.2, or there's low glu glucose because the bugs are eating it. So for anything that's complicated, we've got to drain it with a chest tube. And then um, the lights criteria for transudative, have you all been pimped on that to oblivion? What are lights criteria? LDH is low in and of itself, under 200. If the LDH uh, effusion to serum ratio is less than 0.6, and the protein effusion to serum ratio is less than 0.5, it's transudative. All three of them have to be present for it to be transudative. If any one of these is violated, it's exudative. Okay, so um, pulmonary embolism, we talked about this a little bit already. Remember that the risk factors for this, um, surgery, any post-op patient uh, is at risk for PE, long car ride, cancer or nephrotic syndrome both give a hypercoagulable state. And remember the symptoms, got the pleuritic chest pain, they might be spitting up blood, uh, tachypnea is probably the most common symptom. They might have a decreased pulse ox, and they're probably going to be tachycardic. So random signs, they might show you something like this on chest x-ray. It's a little wedge infarct. It's got an eponym, doesn't it? Is that a Westerfield? Westermark. Yeah, Westermark. So, but it's a, it's a wedge infarct from the pulmonary vessel being blocked by the clot. Um, Remember, anytime you suspect it, you got to give them heparin, even before you do your diagnostic workup. And VQ scan or, or spiral CT are both acceptable options. I don't think they'd have you choose between them. Uh, but do remember that pulmonary angiography is the gold standard. It's just a very morbid um, procedure, so we don't like to do it. Um, and remember, for anticoagulation, you treat with heparin right away, and then you give a warfarin bridge. So you can use thrombolytics uh, if it's a really severe clot, but remember the comp uh, contraindications for thrombolytics we talked about earlier. And then you do surgical thrombectomy if the clot is immediately life-threatening. The IVC filter, you may have seen some patients with these placed. I had a couple at the VA. These are when they are at a very risk, a high risk for a hypercoagulable state, but they have contraindications to chronic co anticoagulation, like they fall all the time, they drink 80 beers a day. Uh, we don't want to give them warfarin or heparin, so we might place an IVC filter. Um, okay, so ARDS. So we see the characteristic chest X-ray at the corner of the slide. It's kind of the bilateral fluffy infiltrates, uh, and I wrote a little bit about the patho pathophysiology. Uh, the causes are more important for you guys. Sepsis is the big one. A lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative gram sepsis is a big cause of ARDS. Uh, also aspiration, trauma, uh, or pancreatitis also important for the medicine shelf. So three diagnostic criteria for ARDS. Have you been pimped on this to oblivion? It's not a pulse ox. Um, there, there is a characteristic or a criteria that deals with the amount of oxygen, but it's not um, pulse ox. It's PaO2 over FiO2. So they take the PaO2 from the ABG divided by the fraction of inspired O2 from, you know, their venti mask or whatever. If that ratio is less than 200, it's ARDS. The second criteria is a radiographic criteria, the x-ray that I showed you. And the third one is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure less than 18. So what is this one about? This is ruling out cardiac causes of uh, pulmonary edema. So this third criteria proves that you know, the pulmonary edema is from the problem with oxygenation and not with a problem of forward blood flow. And how do we treat it? 
Oxygen with pressure. Yes, we need PEEP. We need positive pressure ventilation. So, and if you guys memorized all those vent settings and all that business, uh, you've done better than me. I just remember PEEP because we use it for ARDS. Okay, so um, as far as pulmonary function tests, I know that they do a pretty good job in the noon lectures teaching you guys about this, so I'll really only hit the highlights here. Uh, as far as obstructive versus restrictive, look at the FEV1 to FBC ratio. That's really where the money is. If that ratio is decreased, um, if the FEV1 is disproportionately decreased compared to the FBC, we're dealing with an obstructive process. And if the ratio is normal, both the FEV1 and FBC are decreased uh, to an equal extent, then we're probably dealing with restrictive disease. The other thing that I often forget is bronchodilator response. They might ask you what constitutes a positive bronchodilator response, and that magic number is 12%. So if the um, FEV1 improves greater than 12% with albuterol or a bronchodilator, then you've diagnosed asthma. COPD and emphysema, their ratios, their uh, lung volumes don't improve with a bronchodilator. And then the diffusion of carbon monoxide can also help you to determine what type of obstructive process or what type of restrictive process you have going on. Um, the diffusion is reduced in emphysema because you've got all that fibrosis, uh, or the actually you have more space because of the destruction of the alveoli. It's also reduced in interstitial lung disease because of the fibrosis. It's harder for the oxygen molecules to get across. Okay, so know your COPD. How do we diagnose an acute exacerbation? What are we asking them about? Someone just coughed. We ask them about their coughing, right? Their sputum. So if they have a productive cough um, for longer than three months, in two, over two consecutive years, that's COPD. The exacerbation criteria I'll get to in a minute. Uh, how do we treat COPD? We treat, we treat an exacerbation with steroids for sure. Just um, our outpatient dude with COPD, first line, we'll give them ipratropium or, or the newer teotropium. Um, beta agonist is second line, and then third line if they're really bad, theophylline. We don't like to use theophylline because it's got a pretty narrow therapeutic window and can cause arrhythmias. So when do we start O2? Yes, so if their pulse ox is less than 88, or if you do a blood gas and it's less than 55. Uh, if they have right heart failure, core pulmonale, they raise the threshold a little bit and start O2 sooner. Here's what I was trying to get to, criteria for exacerbation. This is when their sputum changes. So any change in sputum, amount, color, uh, whatever. Their sputum is changing. It's probably an exacerbation. And how do we treat it? Antibiotics um, and steroids. So usually it's a macrolide and steroids. And then NEBS and, and oxygen. Best prognostic indicator. I got this question wrong maybe two or three times before I finally learned it. It's the best so if a COPD patient says, Doc, how, do I, how long do I have to live? How bad is my COPD? Very good, FEV1. So we do spirometry. FEV1 is the best indicator of prognosis. And what's been shown to improve mortality for COPD? Two things. Yeah, oxygen for a long time, greater than 18 hours a day, I think sounds right to me. And then if they smoke, they got to quit smoking. So those are the two things that have been shown to help. And then an important question, why is our goal for pulse ox 94 to 95% instead of 100? Absolutely, yeah. So these folks are chronic CO2 retainers, so their little uh, respiration sensor doesn't really work in terms of pH or CO2. So they really need hypoxia to drive their respirations. And important vaccinations in the outpatient clinic for our COPDers? Pneumovax, very good, Pneumovax. All right, so our COPD patient says, check out my hands. This just happened six weeks ago. What is up? You guys are so good. Yeah, that's cancer. You need a chest x-ray. So this finding, this physical finding, is called hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. It's really acute onset of clubbing, um, and it, it means cancer. It means lung cancer. So if they ask you for the next best test, uh, it's not pulse ox, it's not spirometry, um, it's chest x-ray. All right, so for asthma, 
If uh, your patient tells you they have symptoms twice a week, but their PFTs are normal, how bad is their asthma? What type of asthma do they have? Mild intermittent. And so they get albuterol only for treatment, just a rescue inhaler. They don't need any kind of daily treatment. Um, if the patient has symptoms four times a week, they cough at night a couple times a month, but their PFTs are still normal, The next one. All right, so what do we treat the next one with? I'll give you that. Yes, so now we add inhaled corticosteroids. Um, if the patient has daily symptoms, a night cough more often, twice a week, and now their FEV1 is starting to go in the crapper, 60 to 80% predicted value. So the treatment we add is a long-acting beta agonist, which is what I heard. So what are the names for these again? So we have mild intermittent, moderate. So there are two flavors of moderate from what I remember. I'm stalling because I actually forgot. I think it's moderate intermittent and moderate consistent. Someone have a book? Anyone want to check me? Someone look it up and get back to me when you get there. Uh, the last one is severe. So from what I remember, there's one flavor of mild, one flavor of severe, and two flavors of moderate. When it's severe, it's when your FEV1 really tanks. It's less than 60%. And the symptoms are pretty much consistent. So what do we add to our treatment regimen here? We've already, what do we add? We can add an oral steroid or like the leukotriene modifi modifying agents. So everything that we had our moderate patients on plus the leukotriene modifying agents and possibly oral steroids if it's really bad. So remember during an exacerbation, if they give you a vignette where the patient is in the ER, um, well, first of all, what would you expect their PCO2 to be if they're in the middle of an asthma attack? High or low? You expect it to be low, right? They're wheezing, they can't breathe, they're tachypnic, they're going to be blowing off a lot of, of CO2. So their PCO2 should be low. What happens, as in what I've described here, when it starts creeping up to normal, maybe a little high? Exactly. Their intercostal muscles, their diaphragm, they're getting tired, and they're not able to compensate for the uh, inflammation in their airways by, by breathing faster. So actually, a normalizing PCO2 is a bad, bad sign. You've got to have a low threshold for that and a low threshold for intubation. Um, and then uh, a complication, this is more in kiddos. There's a complication of asthma, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus. There's a special antibody we look for in the blood for this, um, uh, probably lower yield. Okay, so that's the obstructive diseases. Let's talk about some restrictive lung disease. If they describe one centimeter nodules in the upper lobes with eggshell calcifications is the big buzzword there. It's so silly. Silicosis. That's silicosis. Um, and the thing to remember here is they are very, uh, they're more predisposed to tuberculosis. I think, uh, I think about it in that it makes sense. They're both in the upper lobes of the lung. TB likes to live in those little silicosis nodules. I'm not really sure if that's true, but it is true that people with silicosis are more predisposed to it. So they need a tuberculosis test annually. Um, if the vignette describes reticular nodular uh, markings in the lower lobes and pleural plaques. That's asbestosis. And they are at a higher risk for bronchogenic carcinoma and mesothelioma. So if the um, lesion is a patchy lower lobe infiltrate, you can culture some thermophilic actinomyces. What does that friend do for work? Farmer's lungs. So they they uh, shovel hay or something. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis is more commonly known as farmer's lung. And thermophilic actinomyces is the bug to remember there. So if you see hyalur lymphadenopathy, uh, increased ACE levels, erythema nodosum, the patient might be a young female African-American, sarcoid. So that's sarcoidosis. So some harder questions. They have hypercalcemia, poor K. What? Vitamin D. So they have high vitamin D levels. And why do they have high vitamin D levels? So 
so it's my understanding it's the macrophages. So the macrophages in the granulomas produce a vitamin D-like substance. And that increase in the vitamin D-like substance is what causes the hypercalcemia. So that, that's my understanding of why the blood calcium levels are high. Uh, an important specialist doctor to refer these folks to? Hemonk, maybe. I was thinking opto. They've got a 25% uh, chance of uveitis that can lead to blindness. So if they haven't been evaluated by ophthalmology, that's an important referral. And then for diagnosis, really the only way you can definitively diagnose it is by biopsy, biopsying the non-caseating granuloma, and the treatment is steroids. So you found a pulmonary nodule. What do you do first? Look for an old foam. Yes, good. So the first step, you got to find an old chest x-ray to compare because really you're going to be a lot more concerned if it is increasing in size um, or if it's brand new. So um, out of these little goombas, which one is scarier? This little dude or this guy? This guy is scarier. Why is he scarier? It's bigger. What does he not have? What are some characteristics of a benign nodule? What would make you reassured? What? What? So um, the, the buzzwords you might hear are popcorn calcification. Spiculated is actually usually a scarier sign. If it's got the spicules and the like little bur, bur spurs, um, that's usually uh, the, the calcification pattern of granuloma. It's got, I mean, uh, of, of cancer. If it's popcorn calcification, it's more likely a hamartoma. That is the most common benign pulmonary nodule. Concentric calcifications make you think a granuloma used to live there, like an old TB infection. Uh, and also if they're young, if it's small, if it's well circumscribed, uh, those are all characteristics of something benign. Scary characteristics are if it's got that eccentric or speculated calcification, if they're old, if they've been smoking 80 pack years or whatever, um, that's bad. And so we need to be a little bit more aggressive in the workup. So we need to biopsy the lesion, and depending on where it is in the lung, that'll determine how we get to it, either by bronchoscopy, if it's central, or a, a open thoracotomy, preferably. Um, so it kind of depends on where the lesion is. Okay, so here are your scary cancer symptoms. Weight loss, cough, dyspnea, hemoptysis, where they keep having pneumonia in the same lobe, their lung keeps collapsing, those symptoms all equal um, cancer, right? That is lung cancer. So for the different types of cancers, there are four that you need to know, and there are different buzzwords they can give you to suggest which one they're trying to talk about. So the most common cancer in non-smoking patients, adeno, and it can occur in the scars of old pneumonia. That was something I learned. Um, where do these cancers usually arise? Are they central or peripheral? They're peripheral, and where do they metastasize? Kind of some random places. Well, some of them aren't so random. Liver and bone, those are pretty standard places of metastasis. These also like to go to the brain and adrenals. So adenocarcinoma is one of the peripheral cancers, and it metastasizes to the liver, bone, brain, and adrenal glands. Uh, adenocarcinoma also gives a characteristic pleural effusion. Exudative or transudative, do you think? It's exudative, and it's got high hyaluronidase, if you're looking for it. Probably a little bit um, less high yield, but there you go. So what if we've got a patient who's got all our scary lung cancer symptoms? They also have kidney stones, constipation, they feel like crap. They've got low PTH and their lung mass is centrally located. Very good. So that's the perineoplastic syndrome for squamous cell that you need to remember, hypercalcemia. And that's because they've got the parathyroid hormone-related peptide. So um, what about our patient? Shoulder pain, ptosis, got a, a meiotic pupil, and facial edema. It's a pancos tumor, um, or in the superior sulcus tumor. So this is... Uh, superior sulcus syndrome, also pancos tumor, and it comes from small cell carcinoma. Small cell is also central. So um, you can usually remember it, squamous and small cell, they start with S, they're both central tumors. So we've got another patient with ptosis, but it's better after looking up for a minute. 
Good, Lambert Eaton. So better with continued upward gaze is how you tell it from myasthenia. Uh, Lambert Eaton syndrome is also associated with small cell, and it's because we have those antibodies to the presynaptic calcium channel blockers that I told you about first year. Remember those? It comes full circle. Okay. So uh, old smoker presents with low sodium, uh, but their mucous membranes are moist and they don't have JBD. SIADH from? Small cell. Very good. Uh, and then chest x-ray showing some peripheral cavitation and a, a CT showing pretty widely disseminated metastasis. What's the cancer we haven't talked about yet? Large cell. So the things you need to remember about large cell, it's another peripheral cancer. It's more likely to cause cavitation, and they're usually pretty metastatic uh, upon diagnosis. So really for treatment, we care about small cell and non-small cell. And what's the difference? Yeah, so the non-small cell tumors, it's usually a little bit easier to resect. Small cell tumors are really sensitive to chemo and radiation. So those are the mainstays of treatment first line. All right, I only have a few slides on gastroenterology, mainly concentrating on inflammatory bowel disease. So between Crohn's disease and um, that other one, UC, thanks. Which one involves the terminal ileum? Crohn's, good. And remember, the symptoms can mimic appendicitis, and because it involves the ileum, they can have iron deficiency anemia. Um, continuous and involving the rectum, UC or Crohn's? That's UC. Who has an increased risk for primary sclerosis and cholangitis? You see. Who's more likely to have fistulae? Crohn's. And anytime you see a fistula, metronidazole is the drug of choice. Who has granulomas? Crohn's. Who has transmural inflammation? Crohn's. Who's cured by colectomy? You see. Who has a lower risk if they smoke? You see. You see. So smoking increases the risk for Crohn's, decreases the risk for UC. Um, and which one gives you a higher risk of colon cancer? UC. That's another reason. They can be cured by colectomy, and it can prevent the, the colon cancer that they have an increased risk for. And then which one is associated with P. Anca? UC. Good. Okay. So treatment, um, ASA, sulfasalazine, um, can maintain remission. Corticosteroids is given during a flare to induce remission. And as I said, metronidazole for any ulcer or abscess in a patient with Crohn's. So some pictures you might see. Um, this is an abdominal x-ray. I don't know if you can see that. The arrows are trying to point to some badness in the wall of the colon. This is toxic megacolon. This is pneumocystis intestinalis, air in the wall of the colon. Hard to appreciate on this chest x-ray, but you can see it's widely dilated, right? This looks bad. So this is toxic megacolon, uh, a surgical emergency. What about this barium study? That's string signs. So what is this? You see your Crohn's? Crohn's, more likely in Crohn's. What's this badness? Pyoderma gangrenosum. Should we give antibiotics for this? Looks like a horrible uh, bacterial abscess, right? So we give we give antibiotics, right? No, no. You treat the underlying UC, and this will get better. Don't IND it. Don't give antibiotics. It's not an infection. This is just granulation tissue and white blood cells. And then these little guys, they're on the anterior anterior tibia. They're painful. Erythema nodosum. So these were also in our sarcoid patient, and they're also present in patients with UC. All right, so LFT buzzwords. What would give you an AST um, bigger than your ALT and a high GGT? It's what you're doing after the shelf, right? You're drinking alcoholic hepatitis. What if your ALT is greater than your AST, and they're both in the thousands? Thinking about a virus? If your AST and ALT are both in the thousands, but you just had major surgery, cardiac surgery, or you were just in a horrible car accident. Shock liver. Yes, so that's ischemic hepatitis. Um, shock liver can be confused with viral hepatitis, but you don't have that characteristic ALT greater than AST. Um, what do you think of when your D-billy is elevated? Uh, 
obstruction. Yeah, I think it's something wrong with the biliary tract, gallbladder, uh, something of that nature. There are also some randoms, right? Dubin's, Johnson's, and Rotor from USMLE Step 1. So um, what about elevated indirect bilirubin? <laughs> Gilbert, very good. And Kriegler and Ajar, right? Those are the two randoms. Uh, what's more common? Hemolysis, hemolysis. So hemolysis is more common. The two randoms are Gilbert's and Kriegler and Ajar syndrome. So, um, okay. So what if on your LFTs you see elevated ALKFOS and elevated GGT? That's obstruction, right? The ALKFOS is pretty nonspecific, but the GGT tells you the problems with the ducts. Um, and what if the ALKFOS is elevated, GGT is normal, and calcium is also normal? Pregnancy. Mm. So what if you're an old man? What? Yes, Paget's disease. Very good. So it also might be an old dude who has to buy a bigger hat because his skull is getting thicker. Um, hearing loss is also common because the little ossicles get all screwed up because uh, of the, the disease. So good, Paget's disease. What if the anti-mitochondrial antibody is positive? PBC, also more common in ulcerative colitis. Uh, what if the anti-smooth muscle antibody is positive? That's autoimmune hepatitis. The difference here, you can treat autoimmune hepatitis with steroids, but it really doesn't help with PBC. So that's a, a, an important treatment difference. So what if you see high iron, low ferritin, and low uh, iron binding capacity, and a screwed up liver? That's hemochromatosis. They also might be diabetic and have that kind of golden skin color. Uh, and as we kind of hinted to earlier, we treat this with phlebotomy, getting rid of some of the, the iron that's overloaded. And what if the cer ceruloplasmin is low and the urinary copper excretion is high? Yes, Wilson's. So um, these patients have hepatitis. They might also have some psychiatric symptoms, mainly because the copper likes to deposit in the basal ganglia. Uh, and then you can see those common Kaiser Fleischer rings in the cornea. All right. Most common bugs causing meningitis. Name me some. Strep pneumo. Neisseria meningitis. And H flu. Listeria we worry about in the old and young. So in little bitty babies and in old people or anybody who's immunocompromised, we'll also think about listeria and so add ampicillin to our treatment regimen. In people who've been recently instrumented in the brain, now we worry about staph, and we treat that with VANC. Um, some other random causes, tuberculosis, remember, can also uh, infect the meninges, and we add steroids to our RIPE therapy for meningeal tuberculosis. And Lyme disease can mimic almost everything. Lyme disease really sucks because any clinical presentation could be Lyme. I don't know. Um, so we treat Lyme meningitis differently than regular Lyme disease. We have to give IV ceftriaxone because it penetrates the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so if you have a patient you're suspecting meningitis, what's the best first step? Antibiotics first. And before you do the LP, remember you always want to check for signs of intracranial pressure. So, you know, look in the eyeballs, look for optic swelling. Um, if it's indicated, get a CT to make sure there's no intracranial swelling. Um, but really the most important first step is to start empiric treatment, especially if they've got like horrible bruising, spotted rash, you think it's meningitis. Uh, so what about if you're the roommate of the kid who has Neisseria meningitis? Rifampin, good, so random, right? Rifampin is Neisseria meningitis prophylaxis. So you give that to close contacts of known disease. So um, for pneumonia, if you are thinking the patient has pneumonia, what would you do first? Good, we want to see it. Uh, and what's the most common bug causing pneumonia? Strep pneumo. Most common bug in you and me, healthy young people, hopefully. It's the atypicals, right? So mycoplasma is the most common. Um, and that, remember, is associated with cold agglutinins, and we treat it a little bit differently. A macrolide is the first line of treatment here. If the patient is hospitalized within three months or is in the hospital for more than a week, we start worrying about HAP, hospital acquired pneumonia, or healthcare associated pneumonia. And those bugs are a little bit different. What bugs are we worrying about there? 
Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, E. coli are the main ones. And the treatment's a little bit different there as well. Uh, old smokers with COPD are more prone to a certain kind of pneumonia. H flu. Old smokers with, with COPD are more likely to get H flu. Um, the alcoholics who have the current jelly sputum, there's Klebsiella. And the old dudes who hang out in the hot tubs, <laughs> that's Legionella. Joe Danabom always talks about that. He's like the old man in the hot tub. He has Legionella. I don't know why. So uh, a lot of books describe Legionella pneumonia as pneumonia plus. So it's the, the common respiratory symptoms of pneumonia, but they also might have diarrhea. They might have um, altered mental status. So it's pneumonia plus syndrome is Legionella. Uh, if they just had the flu, what might grow in their lungs? Staph. And <laughs> they're a farmer. They just delivered a baby cow in the barn, and now they're, uh, they got pneumonia and vomiting and diarrhea. Q fever. Coxiella Bernetti. Wait, what did you guys say? <laughs> what? PTSD. PTSD. Oh, no, wrong shelf, wrong shelf. Okay, so that these are kind of random, but you guys just took step one, so you should remember this, right? Okay. What if they just skinned a rabbit? This actually was on my shelf. Tularemia. Tularemia. So if they like live in Arkansas and skinned a rabbit and they not because not because of Arkansas, but they've got it's 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 a well known geographic association. Um whatever. Okay, tuberculosis. So remember, if the patient has, sim has symptoms and you're really worried about TB, got to get a chest X-ray to see what the involvement of the lungs is looking like. For screening, we give the PPD, and there are different thresholds for positive PPD depending on uh, your level of risk. So if the PPD is positive, the next test is always a chest X-ray. If the chest X-ray is positive, we really want to get a sputum culture and do acid fast staining of the sputum. If the chest X-ray is negative, it takes three negative sputum cultures to reassure us that, that we're okay. If the chest X-ray is positive, we got to treat them for nine months um, or six months, as it says here, with four drug treatments, and then we can narrow down after the sensitivities come back. Um, uh, a question I got wrong, so I put on this slide. The only people who get chemoprophylaxis, like if they have a known contact with someone with proven TB, the only people who are given INH for prophylaxis are little babies or little kids under the age of four. Everybody else, you don't treat them until you diagnose it. So just being exposed to someone with TB um, isn't enough to warrant treatment. So they love the side effects of these medications. So what are some side effects of rifampin? Orange, right? My daddy went to UT. He always wanted to take this so he could be, you know, patriotic for his school. So your body fluids turn kind of like a reddish orange. It's also an inducer of cytochrome P450. INH? Neuropathy, so we give B6, yep, pyridoxine with it. Uh, pyrazinamide, kind of random. Eyes is a thambutol. Pyrazinamide really doesn't have very many side effects. It can give you a hyperuricemia, but it's usually not enough to cause gout. Uh, a thambutol causes optic neuritis, and it's like E for eye, eye symptoms with a thambutol. Okay, so endocarditis, the most common bug. Acute endocarditis? Staph. If it's acute, if it's attacking native valves, it's more common to be staph aureus. Uh, if it's subacute on um, native valves, then the most common bug. Sorry. I said most common valve first. The most common bug is Virden's group strep. And the, most, the, the valve that's the most commonly affected is the mitral valve. Okay. So if they're an IV drug user, you're thinking staph, and what valve does it attack? Tricuspid, yeah, it's more likely to be right. And remember, right-sided heart murmurs, I didn't mention it earlier, but right-sided heart murmurs are always worse with inspiration. So that's how you can tell the clinical vignette is pointing you in that direction. So we diagnose this with blood cultures, then we want to do an echo, and then there are major and minor criteria that I'm sure you've seen in your books. Uh, what are we worried about as complications for endocarditis? Yeah, so emboli, definitely. Emboli to either the lungs or the brain are an Im are important complication. The most common cause of death is actually due to the just local destruction of the valve. So 
um, congestive heart failure is more common to kill them, but we do worry about uh, emboli as well. So treatment for endocarditis depends on what they have. Um, and prophylaxis for endocarditis, they like to ask questions about this. Who needs prophylaxis? So you need prophylaxis if you have a prosthetic valve, any kind of um, mechanical valve that's not yours. If you've ever had endocarditis in the past, you need prophylaxis. Or if you have like a VSD or a ASD, other congenital lesion that hasn't been corrected yet. Those are all indications for endocarditis prophylaxis. And, ah, so important. What do you do if you find strep bovis bacteremia or strep bovis endocarditis? Colonoscopy, why? Because it's associated with colon cancer. Very good. Okay. So HIV is huge on this test um, and the complications and other opportunistic infections associated with it. So when is the clinical vignette trying to suggest to you that they're talking about HIV? If uh, the patient travels a lot for work, that, that in USMLE land means they have a lot of unprotected sex. I don't know why, and my husband travels a lot for work, so it makes me really nervous. Um, anyway, other things, uh, remember the acute retroviral syndrome looks a lot like mono. So if it looks like mono, uh, even if you're pretty sure it's mono, if, you know, next best step is the question and HIV test is an answer choice, pick it. Um, if, the, if the young patient has a new Bell palsy, Bell's palsy, and they're not pregnant, um, HIV can cause Bell's palsy. HIV can also cause thrombocytopenia. So if the patient just feels crappy and their platelets are low, do an HIV test. Um, anytime there's an unexplained weight loss, or you have any opportunistic type infections. If there's thrush, uh, HSV, um, shingles, Kaposi sarcoma, any of those AIDS-related illnesses, suspect HIV. So in terms of treatment and prophylaxis, the highly active retroviral therapy, you usually start it when CD4 count goes below 350. That's the, the threshold. Or if the viral load is over 55,000. Pregnant ladies get a lower threshold because we want to prevent um, transmission. Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, these are side effects. So what HIV drug causes uh, leukopenia, GI symptoms, and macrocytic, macrocytic anemia? Some of these are kind of random, but this one I would know. No, it's a drug. What HIV drug causes this? Out of this list, this is the only one I would memorize for sure. It's sidovudine. And the macrocytic anemia is important. If you've got an AIDS patient, they're anemic, uh, you know, you look at the smear and there are macrocytes, zidovudine is really, really classic for causing both a decrease in white blood cells and a macrocytic anemia. The rest of these are kind of random. Pancreatitis is caused by didanosine. Um, a really bad hypersensitivity reaction can happen with abacavir. Uh, kidney stones and hyperbilirubinemia can happen with adenivir. That's a, a protease inhibitor. And then, like, really bad psychotic symptoms happen with efavirenz, and that's a non-nucleoside reductase, NNRI. It's an NNRI. So um, as far as, as post-exposure prophylaxis is concerned, anytime you have a needle stick injury with an HIV-positive patient, you're treated with a triple drug um, regimen for four weeks. So um, not one drug, not two drugs. You always need the highly active retroviral therapy for known HIV exposure. So in our HIV patient, if they present to you with dyspnea on exertion, they've got this non-productive cough, fever, chest pain. Oh, I told you. We're thinking pneumocystis, right? So PCP is, is the most common opportunistic infection. And this is what the chest X-ray likes, looks like. It's not very impressive. It's kind of some fluffy bilateral um, infiltrates on the chest X-ray. Uh, and of note, the LDH can be elevated in the blood. Um, the best test after a chest X-ray? Yeah, we want to see the sputum. We'll get um, Not sputum, but we'll want to get a sample. So bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, we need that to, to actually see the bug. First line of treatment, trim sulfa. What if you're sulfa allergic? Dapsone. Or pentamidine. So dapsone with trimethoprim, um, primaquine clinda, I've never seen that used, but aerosolized pentamidine uh, is another alternative. And then when do you add steroids? When it's really bad. When the pneumonia is so bad, their arterial blood gas dips below 70. And prophylaxis, when do we give it? 
Less than 200. Very good. So less than 200 CD4 count, we give it. Trimsulfa is the first line, and the same drugs used for treatment are uh, second, third, and fourth line, respectively. Okay, so our HIV-positive patient for, has diarrhea. There are three main flavors of this. So CMV, uh, MAC, and cryptosporidium can all cause diarrhea in an HIV-positive patient. With CMV, we can see this on colonoscopy and biopsy. We can actually you know, do staining for the virus, the intranuclear inclusions, uh, and then we can treat it accordingly. MAC um, is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. We can't really see. The biopsy is going to be negative on the colonoscopy. There won't be any, like, stool, ova, or parasites uh, on the testing. But cryptosporidium, those are the ones, those are the little parasites whose oocysts are acid fast. So with CMV, we can see it on biopsy. With cryptosporidium, we can stain, use an acid fast stain for the oocysts. And MAC, uh, we prophylax for that if the, um, if the CD4 count is really low and we can't find another reason for the diarrhea. Okay, so um, HIV patients are also privy to a whole host of neurologic symptoms um, and neurologic problems. So if we see on CT multiple ring-enhancing lesions, what? Toxo, good. What if there's just one? Primary CNS lymphoma. How do we treat them? Pyrimethamine sulfadiazine, I think is how you say it. And you actually treat them both the same. Any ring-enhancing lesions in an HIV patient treat with a trial of pyrimethamine sulfasalazine. And if it gets better, we know it must have been toxo. If that one lesion is still there, we're thinking maybe it's CNS lymphoma and you might consider a biopsy. So um, really multiple versus single helps you see whether infection or cancer is more likely. But in real life and on the test, you treat them both the same. You treat them with antibiotics and see if it helps. So um, if a HIV positive patient has a seizure and they have this weird deja vu aura and then you do a spinal tap and there are 500 RBCs and CSF, that's characteristic for... Anybody done neuro? What, what does a deja vu aura tell you about a seizure? Where did it start? Temporal lobe. What virus goes to the temporal lobe? HSV. HSV is also um, known to have a small amount of red blood cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's a hemorrhagic, um, slightly hemorrhagic spinal fluid. So HSV encephalitis is what we'd be thinking there. And we treat with acyclovir ASAP. As soon as you suspect it, don't wait for viral culture, don't do an EEG, treat with, um, treat with acyclovir as soon as you can. So uh, the most common cause of meningitis in an HIV positive patient, it's actually strep pneumo. But what else are you worried about opportunistic infection wise? Yes. So cryptococcus is a consideration in an HIV positive patient. Don't get me wrong, the most common cause of meningitis is still strep pneumo, whether they're HIV positive or not. So we'd be worried about cryptococcus, though. We do an India ink test to, to look for that, and amphotericin IV is the drug of choice. Uh, what if our HIV patient has hemisensory loss, visual problems, and a Babinski? Kind of sounds like MS. These patients kind of present with a picture that looks like multiple sclerosis. That's associated with a virus. AIDS patients get it. Think back to Dr. Krolik back in the day. It's PML, PML, the, poly, the JC polyomavirus. Y'all remember that? So this disease um, is demyelinating. That's why it has symptoms that are similar to MS, and it preferentially affects the gray-white junction. So here we really need to do a brain biopsy to, to tell whether or not we've got it. And it doesn't really matter because there's no treatment. The treatment for, for um, PML is just to improve the CD4 count. And lastly, if we've got an HIV patient, this is sad. They're like in their 30s and they've got like pretty bad dementia, not walking well, not remembering stuff well. There's no other cause. Yeah, AIDS dementia complex. So um, not really anything we can do. You rule out all the treatable causes and then um, give supportive care. Okay, so neutropenic, neutropenic fever, is that a big deal? All right, so when they present to the ER, what are you not going to do to them? Stick your finger in their butt. 
So neutropenic, neutropenic, neutropenic fever patients never get a DRE. Why not? Why you can. You can induce bacteremia in these patients uh, by inducing translocation of, of normal gut flora across the wall. So never, ever digital rectal exam. So we define neutropenic fever by a single temp that's super high or a sustained temp that's a little bit uh, more low grade for more than an hour. Uh, and the absolute neutrophil count is less than 500. So the most common cause of bacteremia, we kind of hinted to this, is mucositis. Any, anywhere along the GI tract, the bacteria can just translocate due to the inflammation. Uh, most common bugs here are Pseudomonas and MRSA, especially if they've got a port for chemo. And the workup here, you always want to get a blood culture uh, and then start antibiotics. So ceftazidime um, and cefepime are the, the most common drugs of choice. So we'll add vancomycin if um, they've got a port or you've got reason to suspect a line infection. And if the patient doesn't get better within five to seven days, add amphotericin because maybe it's fungal. So um, things to remember for the exam, this is a big deal, and don't put your finger in their butt. So other random infections, what gives you a targetoid rash, fever, cranial nerve 7 palsy, meningitis, AV block? Lyme disease, it can do anything. What do we treat it with? What if I'm a six-year-old kid? They can't have doxy, amoxicillin, good. That's kind of a dirty question. That's more of a peds thing, but uh, it could be on there. So um, what if you have a rash that's at your wrist and ankles, palms and soles, fever and headache? Rocky Mountain spotted fever, what do we treat it with? What if I'm a six-year-old kid? Doxy anyway. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, amoxicillin doesn't work. So even if the kid is under age eight, eight is the cutoff, uh, everybody gets doxy for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So what if uh, you've got a history of a tick bite? The, the dude saw the tick bite him, but there's no rash, but they do feel like crap. They've got myalgia, fever, headache. Their platelets are also low. This is a random one. Oh, my God, you guys are so good. I pimped my, my radiation oncology resident on this today, the chief resident. I was like, hey, what are the symptoms of ehrlichosis? He was like, screw you, go write the patient note. <laughs> True story. Anyway, um, we also treat this with doxy. So take home message, if a tick bites you, take doxy. Because no matter what it is, even if you can't remember what exactly the bug is, if the question is how to treat it, the answer is doxy, unless you're a little kid uh, and you're not suspecting Lyme. So what about in an immune-suppressed patient? They've got a cavitary lung disease, weight loss, fever. Um, and when you look at the sputum, it's got gram-positive um, um, bugs that are branching, and they're partially acid-fast. Nocardia, very good. So nocardia, those are the ones that are aerobic because they're in the lung, and that's where air is. Uh, and you treat it with trimsulfa. What about the other um, branching bacteria that is anaerobic? Yeah, so that's actinomyces, um, and for this, we need high-dose penicillin. Okay, good. So the kidneys, my favorite organ. I love the kidneys. So with uh, nephrology always comes uh, electrolytes and fluid balance. So remember that hyponatremia is caused by too much water. So the first things you want to do are check the osmolarity and then check the volume status. Are they hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic? So um, some causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia, congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, cirrhosis, um, hypovolemic hyponatremia, that's if you're losing a lot of fluids either by taking too much Lasix or vomiting, and then euvolemic hyponatremia, really the, the main thing it should make you think of on the test is SIADH. So if they're a smoker, it's chest x-ray city. So uh, more importantly for your exam, how do we treat it? So Normal saline, obviously, anytime the patient is hypotensive or shows symptoms of being fluid down, just give them normal saline because that's how we resuscitate them. The only time you would give hypertonic saline, 3% saline, is if they're symptomatic, if they're having seizures related to the low sodium, or if their sodium's in the toilet, less than 120. Uh, otherwise, if they're not volume down and if they're not having seizures, you just fluid restrict them and wait for the uh, fluid balance to come back into equilibrium. Why don't we want to uh, treat this too fast? Central pontine myelinolysis. So the magic number, 
you don't want to treat more than 12 to 24 milliequivalents per day. So that's like 0.5 to 1 per hour. And then hypernatremia, hypernatremia then conversely is uh, due to a loss of water, and we treat it by replacing water. So that's about it. Again, we don't want to go too fast here because we can see cerebral edema as the um, adverse effect of that. So central pontine myelinolysis when you correct hyponatremia, cerebral edema when you correct hypernatremia too aggressively. All right, so what if your patient has numbness, uh, those, those dead guys who I can't say, or a prolonged QT interval? Hypocalcemia, very good. Uh, what about bone stones, groans, crazy? Hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia, oops, hypercalcemia, good. Uh, what if they've got some paralysis, uh, they're very constipated, when you do an EKG, you see ST depression and some U waves? Hypokalemia, and those peak T waves we saw earlier? Hyperkalemia, oops, that's how you treat it, hyperkalemia. More importantly, how do you treat hyperkalemia? Because you might very well get a question on this. Calcium gluconate is first. Why? Stabilizes the cardiac membranes, right? So that's first, but that doesn't do anything about having too much potassium in your body. So what do we do for that? You can do K-exalate. A lot of hospitals don't do that, but they still use it at the VA. K-exalate basically makes you poop out potassium, so that helps. What else? Insulin with glucose too, right? So insulin to drive the um, potassium into the cells. But we still have too much in our body. How do we get rid of it? Diuretics. Good. So that's the treatment regimen. So calcium gluconate, insulin and glucose, k um, Albuterol works through a similar mechanism to insulin and then um, and diuretics to get rid of it. Last resort, if the patient's really symptomatic and potassium is sky high, it's an indication for dialysis. So acid-base disorders, I won't belabor these. Um, let's just hit the high points. If the um, bicarbonate is high and PCO2 is high and they are uh, alkalotic, then we know it's metabolic. And the next test then to do would be a urine chloride because that's how we tell what is causing the metabolic alkalosis. So if the chloride is high, then we're thinking maybe we've got a hyperaldosterone state, uh, whereas if the chloride is low, then we're doing something to lose chloride, either too aggressive NG suction, too much throwing up, um, so forth and so on. So if we've got a, an alkalosis where CO2 is low and bicarb is low, then it's respiratory, right? So we're blowing off too much of the CO2. That's like in our, our uh, asthma attack patient in the early stages. So if uh, bicarb is low and PCO2 is low, that's describing a metabolic acidosis, and the next thing to calculate if they give you the information to do so is the anion gap. So uh, remember that normal is 8 to 12, and if it's elevated, start thinking about one of those items in the differential that fills out that mnemonic mud piles. Uh, and then non-gap metabolic acidoses, there are fewer causes there. Diarrhea um, and diabetic use are the main ones. And then those silly renal tubular acidoses. Anybody else have a hard time with those? Me too. I got a slide on them coming up. And then PCO2 is high and bicarb is high. That's a respiratory acidosis. Hyper, hypoventilation is the overwhelming cause of that. So let's talk about these RTAs. They're a cause of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So type 1, is it proximal or distal? Distal. Uh, and the cause is lithium is the main one that I've seen in clinical vignettes. Uh, and at presentation, the things to remember are that the urine is alkalotic and in the blood there's low potassium. So how do we treat type 1 RTA? We'll give them bicarb. We'll give them bicarb because the problem is with proton excretion, giving oral bicarb will help. That's in contrast to type 2 that we'll talk about right now. So type 2 is proximal. Uh, the most common cause that I've seen in clinical vignettes is multiple myeloma, and it's also hypokalemic on presentation, uh, but the problem is they can't reabsorb bicarb. So giving bicarbonate doesn't solve the problem here because our problem uh, in pathogenesis is we can't reabsorb it. So here, 
we just give a mild diuretic and replete their potassium. So type 4 is hyperrenemic hypoaldosteronism, uh, and the overwhelming majority are caused by diabetes. So that's the important thing to remember for your clinical vignettes. On presentation, the thing that differentiates it from type 1 and 2 is that they're hyperkalemic, uh, which makes sense, right, if they've got low aldo. And then we treat this by repleting mineralocorticoids, so we give them flugicortisone. So I think to, to get these questions right on the test, remember the major causes of the three types, remember what potassium does, and remember how to treat them. And I think really, and then remember between one and two, the difference between distal and proximal, and whether the problem is protons or bicarb. And you should be able to get all the questions right that, that they could ask you with that information. Okay, definition of acute renal failure. ARF has to do with what thing on chemistry? Creatinine. Okay, does it go up or down? Okay, you're awake, so it goes up. Um, and how much? It's, it's kind of loosely defined. There are a couple different definitions depending on the source. In general, if there's an overall increase by 25% or um, a net increase of 0.5 over baseline, it's acute renal failure. And to further work it up, you want the BUN creatinine ratio because that can help you determine between pre-renal and intrinsic renal causes. Uh, you'll also want to check the urine, uh, sodium, and creatinine so you can calculate the FINA, and you will have to do that on your test probably. Um, and then remember, if the patient's on a diuretic, the FINA is not reliable. You need to calculate the FINURIA. And why is that? Yeah, so if you're on a diuretic, even if your body would naturally want to hold on to it in the pre-renal state, you're going to be peeing out all kinds of sodium because you're taking a diuretic that blocks the channels. So it's not a reliable indicator. So um, treatment is easy if it's pre-renal. Um, you'll want to repeat, replete the fluids or otherwise reverse the cause of the pre-renal azotemia to begin with. Um, and it can be caused by anything that prevents blood flow to the kidneys, either because of global hypoperfusion or um, renal artery stenosis, anything that keeps blood flow from, from getting to the kidneys. So intrinsic causes are a little bit more interesting. So what would be the cause of renal failure in a patient who has muddy brown casts, uh, they just took some amphotericin, amigoglycoside, cisplatin, and they had prolonged ischemia. Okay, ATN, good. So muddy brown casts on UA, that's the hallmark of ATN. Uh, what if the patient has protein in the, in the pee, blood in the pee, eosinophils in the pee, and they also have a fever and a rash after they took some trim sulfa? Yes, that's AIN. And the treatment here, uh, obviously we're going to stop the drug that's causing it because this is a, an allergic reaction that occurs in the kidney. And steroids can also be added um, if it doesn't resolve on its own. So if we've got an army recruit or crush victim, CPK is sky high. There's blood on the dipstick but negative red blood cells. Rhabdo, yes. So first test, this is important. If you suspect rhabdomyolysis, you need to either check potassium or get an EKG. You always want to think about what's going to kill your patient. You know, uh, ATN, um, you know, renal failure is not going to kill your patient immediately, but hyperkalemia will, right? It can, it can cause um, arrhythmias and death. So if you ever suspect crush injury or suspect they're trying to point you in the direction of rhabdo, get a potassium level or an EKG. So what if you see enveloped-shaped uh, crystals on the urinalysis? Yeah, life's not that bad, right? Don't, don't drink the antifreeze. So ethylene glycol intoxication will give you envelope-shaped crystals, and that causes an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, and then if you get a bump in creatinine a day or two, or two or three days, rather, after a cardiac cath or a contrast CT, Good. Contrast-induced nephropathy. The timeline is important here. 48 to 72 hours is very characteristic if contrast-induced nephropathy is going to happen. All right. So the five indications for emergent dialysis. What's the A for? Acidosis. E? Electrolytes, specifically potassium. I? Intoxication, specifically of? Lithium glycol or lithium, sure. Um, o, super bad CHF, U, uremia. 
So what they might say to suggest uremia in a clinical vignette, pericarditis or like really bad confusion, altered mental status. So don't fall into the trap. Uh, a creatinine of a million is not an indication for emergent dialysis. Well, maybe a million, but not a high one. Okay, so for chronic kidney disease, um, you know this from working with our population, the number one cause is diabetes. Second most common is hypertension. Most common cause of death are cardiovascular complications. So the complications you'll look for, this will be in a vignette that's describing an outpatient visit. Uh, hypertension can cause CHF. You can get um, an anemia because the kidney disease leads to a loss of erythropoietin. Uh, there are electrolyte abnormalities. You can see high potassium, high phosphorus, and low calcium. And then you can get a secondary hyperparathyroidism. The low calcium, because of the kidney disease, tells the parathyroid gland to ramp up PTH. And then uremia, we talked about, um, about the symptoms of that. The other one I would add uh, are bleeding after, after an operation. So that could show up on your surgery shelf or your medicine shelf. Uremia from chronic kidney disease causes the platelets not to um, clot properly, so they're at an increased risk of bleeding. So your patient's peeing blood, best first test. UA, what if painless hematuria? It's what until proven otherwise. Cancer, so either of the bladder or the kidney. Um, terminal hematuria, that means you're peeing fine and then you got a few clots at the end. That's bladder cancer, very good. Um, if the blood cells look like little Mickey Mouse ears, yeah, that's glomerular problems. Uh, if they're dysmorphic. The definition of nephritic syndrome. So proteinuria, but not, not nephrotic range. What else? Hematuria, hypertension, and kidney failure, azotemia. So good. And um, so what if you're peeing blood one to two days after a runny nose, sore throat, and cough? This is the most common cause of nephritis. What? Mm, not one to two days later. And this is after like a virus, runny nose, cough, kind of like flu -y type stuff. Burgers. So IgA nephropathy, the timeline is important. See the difference between these two? One to two days later, and if they're more viral symptoms, that's burgers, IgA nephropathy. If it's one to two weeks later, and they had a sore throat or impetigo, then you're thinking post-strep. So um, it seems silly, but the time course really is the determining factor here. Hematuria plus hemoptysis, that's bad. Good pastures. Hematuria plus deafness, and maybe a positive family history. Alports, good. Very good. And those are both problems with collagen 4, either an antibody against it in the basement membrane or a mutation in it. All right, so what if you're a kiddo peeing blood after a, an infection, and also with arthralgias and purpura and abdominal pain? Enoch Sean line, good. A, hito, a kiddo status per, post hamburger and diarrhea with renal failure. It must have been late when I was making this slide. Um, yes, that's HUS, good. The maha is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and petechiae. Those are other um, symptoms of HUS. A cardiac patient after teclopidine, and renal failure, maha, low platelets, fever, and altered mental status. TTP, good. So why is the teclopidine in there? It's been shown to cause TTP. So they actually don't use teclopidine very much anymore because it shows um, an increased risk of having TTP. So the important thing to remember here, the treatment is emergent plasmapheresis. Do not give platelets to these patients. That will be an answer choice. Do not choose it uh, because the, the process that's consuming the platelets and causing the thrombocytopenia is going to just continue to consume any more platelets you throw in there. So uh, this can be a confusing clinical picture to confuse with DIC. You can tell the difference because your coags will be normal in either HUS or TTP. Uh, prothrombin time and um, PTT are both going to be normal. Um, so a patient who has C. anca, kidney and lung and sinus involvement, and they're peeing blood. Wagner's, good. Um, P. anca, asthma eosinophilia. Schurg-Strauss. P. 
Anka, no lung involvement, and they might have Hep B. Yeah, here's polyarteritis nodosa. Good. Okay, so kidney stones, uh, they hurt like the Dickens. The best test is a CT because that's going to detect all stones, not just the ones that will show up on, a, on an X-ray. Uh, the most common type of kidney stone? Calcium oxalate. Uh, a kid who has a family history of kidney stones? Cysteine. Um, chronic indwelling Foley, and their pee is very alkaline. Good. Struvite stones from um, any type of bug that's got a urease. So Proteus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, or Staph. Uh, if a kiddo with leukemia is being treated with chemo, and then they develop stones. Uric acid stones. Good. And oop, if um, after a bowel resection for volvulus, you're at risk for pure oxalate stones. Uh, and that's because if you have a large segment of bowel that's resected, you can't adequately reabsorb the calcium. So the oxalate that's left behind precipitates out and makes a pure oxalate stone. So little bitty stones, how do we treat them? Yeah, sucks to be you. So got to pass them, give them some fluids. If it's a ginormous two-centimeter stone, For the, for the super giant ones, we cut them out. For the medium-sized ones, we'll use lithotripsy. So super small, tough luck, got to pass it. Super huge, we'll actually surgically remove it. Somewhere in between, we'll break it up and let the fragments pass. So for proteinuria, the best first test is to repeat the UA because it may just be a transient um, finding. The definition of nephrotic syndrome, that's we have um, proteinuria on the larger scale, greater than 3.5. Also, low albumin, edema, and hyperlipidemia. So what they might describe in the vignette are some fatty or waxy casts. Uh, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kiddos? What? Minimal change. And in adults? Membranous. Good. What about in a patient who's using heroin or has AIDS? Focal segmental. Um, associated with chronic hepatitis, remember no proliferative, um, and this is important right here. If a nephrotic patient suddenly develops flank pain, are you worried about that? Is it a kidney stone or what? You're worried about renal vein thrombosis, absolutely. So why? Why are we so scared about renal vein thrombosis in a nephrotic syndrome patient? Absolutely. So we know they're peeing protein, right, because their glomeruli suck. Uh, they're also peeing out clotting factors and um, coagulation necessary things. So renal vein thrombosis is always the biggest fear if someone with nephrotic syndrome gets flank pain. And some other random causes, uh, you can have just orthostatic proteinuria. Uh, multiple myeloma can cause proteinuria. Um, pregnancy can cause proteinuria, fever, or congestive heart disease. Okay, so some hemonc stuff. Probably the last section I'll be able to cover. So we've got a patient who walks in with microcytic anemia and this smear and these labs. So the MCV is 70. It's kind of low. Uh, low iron, high TIBC, low retix, RDW, and ferritin. So that's iron deficiency. What if um, we've got the same smear and... The only thing that's different is the TIBC is low. Now we're worried about chronic disease for number two. For number three, check out this smear, and the MCV is super low, 60. What? Thalassemia, absolutely. So thalassemia is characterized by a really low MCV, and what is the significance of the low RDW? Yeah, there's little variation, right? If it's a genetic defect, all the red blood cells are going to be affected by the thalassemia, whereas um, in, in another cause, there might be more retics, so there's going to be greater variation in the size of the red blood cells. Uh, so what about this little microcytic friend, 70 MCV? The iron is actually high, low TIBC, high ferritin, and this smear. Can you see it well on this this thing? 
it's sideroblastic anemia. It's sideroblastic anemia. So this one, you'll see ring sideroblasts in the bone marrow, which we can't see on the smear. Um, and other things that might help you in the clinical vignette, isoniazid can cause sideroblastic anemia. So they might tell you that the patient was on INH for tuberculosis. Okay, so for macrocytic anemia, if you see one of these dudes, what's that? It's a hypersegmented neutrophil. So what if this is your vignette, high MCV, high homocysteine, but normal methylmalonic acid? That's folate. What's up, step one? Okay, so that's folate. What if both homocysteine and methylmalonic acid are high? That's B12. And they might give you neurologic symptoms also. Uh, if the MCV is, is high and you've got one of these dudes, this is called an acanthocyte. Remember that from Nan Claire? What would cause that? Liver disease. So liver disease is another cause of macrocytic anemia, and acanthocytes on a smear help us out. I'm going to tell her y'all didn't remember. Okay, so um, what if the MCV is normal, but LDH is high, so is indirect bilirubin, and the haptoglobin is low? What are we worried about? What would cause high LDH in the blood, high indirect bilirubin, hemolysis? So these are all um, cases of hemolytic anemia, a sickle cell kid with a sudden drop in hematocrit, um, that's an aplastic crisis uh, or a sickle crisis. So uh, the causes for that are either hypoxia, dehydration, or acidosis. If um, you have cyanosis of the fingers, ears, nose, uh, and maybe had a walking pneumonia, cold agglutinins, and the destruction of the blood cells are due to IgM, uh, immunoglobulins. If there's a sudden onset of hemolytic anemia after you take some drugs, penicillin, cephalosporins, sulfas, warm agglutinins, warm agglutinins. So uh, G6P can be precipitated by sulfas. Um, yeah, so that's really not fair. I was trying to get at warm agglutinin disease here. It's caused by either a drug reaction or an underlying malignancy. And the difference here is instead of IgM, it's mediated by IgG. So if the spleen is big, there's a positive family history of this type of illness, uh, there's bilirubin gallstones, the mean cell hemoglobin concentration is high. Yeah, hereditary spherocytosis. We've got to treat that by taking out the spleen. If they're complaining of peeing really dark when they first wake up in the morning, they might have Bud Chiari syndrome for clots in the IVC. PNH, yes, paroxysmal nocturnal, nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And from step one, that's a defect um, in, yeah, whatever. I don't remember that. Okay, so here's, here's the one you were trying to get at earlier. Sudden onset of hemolytic anemia after permaquin, sulfa drugs, or fava beans, which I had the other day. They're delicious. There's our G6P dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay, so with thrombocytopenia, uh, low platelets on our, on our CBC, if it's a young woman who's got recurrent epistaxis, uh, really heavy menstrual bleeding and petechiae, and when you do the CBC and all the workup, the only thing that's low are the platelets. That's what? ITP. ITP. So prednisone is medical management, splenectomy if that doesn't work. Uh, what if it's a, a young woman with recurrent epistaxis, heavy menstrual bleeding, petechiae, but the bleeding time and the PTT are high? Ooh, um, not DIC, von Willebrands, yes. So why is the PTT high in von Willebrands? Yeah, because von Willebrands is bound to factor eight. Very good. So now I've got a 20-year-old male who's got recurrent bruising, hematuria, hemarthroses, elevated PTT, and we correct it with mixing studies. Hemophilia. What's this mixing studies business? It means something's deficient, right? So if you've got a problem with PTT and you mix it with normal blood and it corrects, that means something was missing in the patient's blood that you added when you mixed. So that's what a mixing study does. If you have a mixing study, you've got an elevated PTT, and then you put in normal blood and it still doesn't work, that means there's an inhibitor that's present. So even if you add the factor, the inhibitor in the patient's blood is going to screw it up. Uh, so <laughs> our fourth patient is a 50-year-old meditarian, just finished two weeks of clindamycin, 
has hemarthroses and oozing at its venipuncture sites. Vitamin K deficiency. I thought I was being tricky, but you guys got it. Right? He's a meditarian. He doesn't eat any vitamin K-rich foods. And he took Clinda, so he wiped out all his gut flora. He doesn't have vitamin K. Um, what about a 50-year-old beeritarian with severe cirrhosis and thrombocytopenia? So why would liver disease cause thrombocytopenia? Yeah, because your liver makes your factors, right? So if your liver's shot, you're not going to make them. What's the first one depleted? Seven. And so the PT, what that means for us clinically, is in early liver failure, the PT is going to rise first before the PTT, because factor seven is the first one to go. And the two factors not depleted in liver failure, because they're made in the epithelial cells or endothelial cells, eight and von Willebrand's. So they're not made by the liver, so liver disease doesn't affect them. Okay, so we'll go through a couple more slides, and then it's going to be nine o'clock, so we'll have to stop. So um, if a patient walk in, walks in with thrombocytopenia and this, is that scary? What is that? Schistocytes. So that's scary. And if the PTT and PT are both high, fibrinogen is low, D-dimer and fibrin split products are high, there's your DIC. So what causes it? Sepsis, right? LPS from gram-negative sepsis, some OB stuff. Some other things. Oh, when you treat M3 AML, remember that? The hour rods, that causes DIC. Snake bites, don't get bit by a snake. Okay, so there's some of the causes. The treatment, not much works, right? You gotta correct the underlying factor. You can give FFP to replace the fibrinogen. You can transfuse platelets in this scenario, but really, unless you correct what started this whole thing in the first place, you're kinda toast. Um, if the PT and the PTT are normal, but we still have the smear, TTP, good, we just talked about it. So HUS or TTP, and the causes of that, O157H7 causes um, HUS, and then there are some drugs that are associated with TTP. The most important one for you is going to be teclopidine. And then the treatment, do we want to give them platelets? No, what do you want to do? Plasmapheresis, good. So if you're going to go into pathology, uh, TTP is like one of the only things they'll pay you for on the weekends. Little known fact. Okay, so um, seven days post-op, a patient develops a clot in their artery, one of their arteries, and the platelets are low. So low platelets, but clots. Heparin, yes, HIT. So post-op, they probably got heparin during the operation. That's going to cause HIT. The mechanism is an antibody that binds to um, heparin and the PF4, and we treat it by stopping the heparin and um, start leporudin. That's the anticoagulant of choice for that. And in somebody who has a thrombus that's unprovoked, you always want to think about cancer, especially if they're old. Lupus anticoagulant, uh, you would see high PTT. They might have a history of multiple spontaneous abortions and a, pos a false positive syphilis test. For protein C and S deficiency, that's where you see that really nasty skin necrosis after warfarin. And we had a picture of this on my uh, medicine shelf. They gave you like a really nasty, like awful bruised looking nasty thing. And uh, it was after you'd given a warfarin and they asked what the mechanism was. So it's protein C and S deficiency. Factor V lighten is the most, co most common cause of um, hypercoagula a hypercoagulable state. AT3 deficiency is important to you because heparin won't work in those patients with AT3 deficiency. Um, and then estrogen, we can't give that to women if they're old and they smoke because they increase risk of clotting. And nephrotic syndrome, we already talked about that mechanism. We pee out our clotting factors, uh, and it puts the patients at risk for renal vein thrombosis. So I think it's nine, so we should probably stop. This was my last section, and I'll post it so you guys can look through my slides. I tried to make it pretty self-sufficient so you can use them to study. But it is nine, right? I can't really see the clock. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep you late. So, no problem. I'll be here for questions if your brain's still working enough to ask them. But good luck on your exam on Friday. <laughs>